Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship on this summer Sunday with Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Whether we are together or apart, Fifth Avenue Church remains committed to providing sacred worship, relevant programming, authentic community, and support to those in need. If you are new to this online space, we encourage you to follow us, get to know us, and let us get to know you. Details on how you can do just that will be provided at the end of this service. Okay. Saints, let's breathe deep. Let's calm our minds, center our hearts. Let's lean into the beauty of worship. Lend our voices to prayer and song. Let's support each other. Let's share the peace of Christ with one another. Let's love each other as we make this journey together. And now, please join me in the responsive call to worship as it appears on your screen. Though there is strife in the world, yet, yet will we, we seek, seek God. God. When our hearts grow heavy and the burdens are overbearing, we, we will, will turn, turn to, to the Lord. Lord. God is with us in all things. We, we can, can place, place our, our trust, trust in, in the God, God of love and, and hope. Let us worship God. Hear the promise of God as recorded in the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. When you call upon me, says God, when you come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, says God, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. Let us seek God with all our heart using the prayer of confession on your screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Therefore, know, my friends, that we are all forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Christ is our model. Christ is our hope. Christ calls us to acts of reconciliation. Please, my friends, take a moment to share the peace of Christ with someone through a text or a call. Enlist yourself in the healing of the broken places in our world with the simple words that Christians have offered to each other for millennia. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. you.
Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 33 and 44 to 50. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Shortly after World War II, Paul Coleman Norton, a classic scholar at Princeton University, wrote an article for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly about a discovery he had made when stationed in Northern Africa during the war. During a lull in the fighting, Norton visited a mosque and examined an ancient book written in Arabic. In this book, he discovered a small parchment with Greek writing, which turned out to be a continuation of the scripture I just read, one that had not been included in Matthew's gospel as we know it. In this version, after Jesus spoke about the angels separating the righteous from the evil and throwing the evil into a furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, the disciples respond in consternation. But master, what of those who have no teeth? And Jesus responds, teeth will be provided. It turns out that scholars sometimes entertain themselves by trying to see if they can get away with a hoax here and there. And Colvin Norton almost did get away with the fact that he had made up this whole story. But one of his students who went on to become a New Testament scholar remembered hearing his professor make this joke years before he was ever stationed in Africa during the war and called him on it. And so we can say with some certainty that Jesus never did say, teeth will be provided. People are adept at mental gymnastics. We're able to understand that when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened, that he's using metaphorical language. We understand that the kingdom of heaven is not literal yeast mixed in flour, the same way that the kingdom of heaven is not literal treasure hidden in a field, or a literal pearl of great value, or a literal net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. But somehow, over the centuries, the evocative image of weeping and gnashing of teeth morphed into shorthand for agonizing suffering that some people will endure in the afterlife. The figurative metaphor of a furnace of fire continues to be interpreted by many people today as a literal experience of eternal torture in a fiery hell for anyone who has not been saved. These symbolic descriptions interpreted literally have become a blunt tool used to terrify people into salvation. But the fact that Jesus speaks to us in parables and metaphors and stories should raise our suspicions of any interpretations of scripture that are too rigid or concrete to allow for nuance or wonder about how these spiritual truths, these glimpses into the realm of heaven, might change the way we live our lives now. Emily Dickinson writes about the kind of pedagogy that Jesus uses this way. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. 
Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. So, what is the kingdom of heaven like? Jesus provides a multitude of examples. The kingdom of heaven is like something small but powerful, able to transform the substance of things as yeast transforms flour. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the earth that we might stumble upon and come to recognize the tremendous value of something we had overlooked before. The kingdom of heaven is like a small object of perfect beauty that inspires us to give away our material possessions. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that can plumb great depths in murky water and gather up such an abundance of fish that we are motivated to sit down and sort through everything, deciding the good we want to keep and the bad that we want to throw away. These parables don't so much describe the kingdom of heaven as invite us to participate in it by recognizing that it's already here in our midst. We cannot comprehend the kingdom of heaven with our intellect. We have to experience it with our heart. The kingdom of heaven inspires transformation and action, a recognition that small actions may lead to mighty consequences. The kingdom of heaven opens our eyes to a new way of seeing the world around us. The kingdom of heaven surprises us with our sudden willingness to sacrifice our own comfort and security for the sake of something of immeasurable value. The kingdom of heaven prompts us to embark on a discernment process, asking what are the righteous things we want to hold on to and what are the evil things we want to throw away. Jesus tells us that at the end of the age, the angels will undertake this process on a cosmic level. That's their job. Our job involves the here and now. When we get glimpses of the kingdom of heaven already breaking into this earthly realm, God calls us to respond. In Luis Alberto Urea's novel, The House of Broken Angels, Big Angel, the patriarch of a large Mexican-American family living in San Diego, has gathered his relatives from far and wide for his 70th birthday party, which will be his last because he's dying of cancer. Among those who come is Big Angel's half-brother, many years his junior, the offspring of his father's second marriage, who is named Little Angel. For Little Angel, Big Angel has been a father figure of sorts for whom he has complicated feelings. Big Angel gave him the books that inspired his love of literature, which led him to become an English professor. Big Angel also participated in tormenting him when he was little. As on one day when Big Angel and their father insisted on teaching the terrified boy to swim by throwing him into the waves over and over and over. Everyone is expected to show up and spend some quality time with a bed-bound patriarch, and so Little Angel finds himself crawling into Big Angel's bed for a heart-to-heart, a time of laughing over stories and sharing memories. At one point in their conversation, Big Angel asks, Tell me, did I do anything good in your life? You gave me the books, Little Angel says. I still have them. Ah, bueno, but what was the best thing I ever did, aside from giving you books? Little Angel says, You called me one morning and told me to get ready because you were coming for me and to tell my mom I'd be gone all day. You wouldn't tell me why, but you told me to bring a coat. So you showed up and we drove east to the mountains. It had snowed up there. Living in San Diego, we never saw snow. So you said, we are going to make a snowball. And that's what we did. Then we got back in the car and drove home. Big Angel says, good. Now tell me the worst thing I ever did. Little Angel protests, but Big Angel insists, tell me, brother, was it the beach? No, Little Angel says. It was the year Dad died. We had 
nothing. I know, I know, it didn't match your suffering, blah, blah, blah. And we had nothing, no car, no money, no food. And it was Christmas. And mom didn't know how we'd afford presents or a Christmas dinner. And you called, you said, don't worry about a thing. I am your big brother. You said, we will come for you Christmas morning, don't worry. And mom cried. She was so relieved. Big Angel says, I'm sorry. No, wait, little angel says, you wanted it. So here it comes. You never showed up. You never came. I am so sorry, big angel says. I finally called. You know what you said? You said it was too much trouble to come get us. Big angel stares at the wall and says, thank you for telling me. I am a bad man. And the little angel says, I forgive you. And big angel sobs. We can't do anything to change the past. All we can do is learn from it, try to hold on to the good, repent of the bad, and change our ways. We can't do anything about the future. That's in God's hands, and God's angels will take care of all the sorting that needs to happen in God's good time. We can do something about the present. We can make choices about today. We can engage in our own sorting process, reflect on our lives within our community. We can do this as individuals. Knowing that we are children of God, made in God's image, we can trust that we have done some good in our lives, sometimes intentionally, sometimes without even realizing it. And knowing that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, we can be sure that we have caused harm, some of which we might be aware of and some that we have been oblivious to. What is the kingdom of God like? like a birthday party that a dying man throws for himself, inviting everyone in his family to come so he can ask them what was the best thing he ever did for them and what was the worst. And he can have an opportunity to rejoice in the good, repent of the bad, and be forgiven and move forward. We can go through a sorting process as a church and a denomination, similar to what many institutions are undertaking today in our country by taking an honest look at our history and asking, where have we been righteous and where have we erred? At Fifth Avenue, our session voted last January to become a Matthew 25 congregation and commit ourselves to the work of increasing congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism and alleviating systemic poverty. We'll be living into this calling in the months and years ahead. And there's no question that this work can feel overwhelming. Where do we even start? Well, one fish at a time, right? The Presbyterian Mission Agency suggests that one place to start is with the 21-day racial justice challenge, which can be undertaken by both individuals and groups. The challenge involves achievable acts like working through the PCUSA's Facing Racism Study Guide, reading The Confession of Belhar, and watching a PBS documentary on Native American boarding schools. What does the kingdom of God look like? It looks like a people of faith who are not going to turn away from asking hard questions and seeking transformation. People willing to do the work of discernment and action that God calls us to do in such a time as this. Again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. Friends, let's not be afraid to drag our nets to shore and look at everything so that we can choose to hold on to what is good and throw out what is bad and experience the wonder of and beauty and transformative power of the kingdom of heaven already manifesting itself right here on earth. 
Let us affirm our faith together using these words from a brief statement of faith. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join us as together we praise God singing the doxology. Friends, all that we have, all that we are, are gifts from God. From our life to our breath, our friendship and financial resources, God has blessed us. And so we give not as if we can pay God back, but out of sincere gratitude. And one of the ways that this church uses your gifts is to support the engagement and the connection of one of our most important resources, all of you. You see, Christ tells us that when two or more gather in his name, he is with us. And key to the mission of this church is the many ways we gather in Christ's name, whether that's in person or digitally, in a small group or at a church-wide event. Engagement supports the work of the entire church as we together seek to build God's world. This is just one of the ways that your gifts to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church help sustain our ministries. There are two easy ways you can give online. Just go to fapc.org slash give or text the word FAPCGIVE to 77977. Thank you from all of us at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Let us pray. God of our learnings, God of our longings, God of our living. We come before you this day in an effort to still ourselves in your presence. Instead of anxiety, we seek your peace. Instead of defeat, we reach for your promise. Instead of sorrow, we yearn for your joy. But stillness is not something we struggle with very much these days. It feels as if time is standing still despite our desire to move forward, to progress, to better ourselves, our communities, and the world. Yet you remind us in scripture that a thousand years to you are like a day, that your faithfulness covers the expanse of times we can't even imagine. And yet we struggle to know what to do with the time that lies ahead of us this day. As a country, we are in desperate need of your wisdom. Sickness and infection abound. Racism and injustice persist. Inequality and inequity pervade every aspect of our society. We seem to be more and more aware of the problems and less and less clear about the solutions. Our hearts are tired and our strength of will is waning. Lord, give us clarity of purpose and the courage to continue to pursue the right path, no matter how hard it is to trot or how high the price may be to us as individuals. Help us to persist and persist and then persist again until every single child of yours is treated as such. As a community, Lord, we mourn the losses that surround us. Loss of loved ones, loss of physical and mental health, loss of companionship, loss of things to look forward to and loss of friends to do life with. We wanna gather, but we aren't sure how. From churches to schools, we want to do what is best, but we don't know what that looks like. 
Imbue us with your patience and humility as we navigate these troubled waters. Finally, Lord, teach us how to be faithful with the time that you have blessed us with. Whether in minutes or hours, days or years, help us to be faithful in all that we say and all that we do, knowing that you are with us in the midst of it all, holding us close, drawing us near, and emboldening us for your service now and forevermore. This we pray in the holy and powerful name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this earthly pilgrimage with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to do kindness, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father who creates, the Son who redeems, the Holy Spirit who stirs the heart and soul, be upon you this day, and remain with you always. Amen.